Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www dot read learn live podcast dot com slash audible to start your 30 day free trial today. And I kept feeling this desire to like tell um, a story that was like truthful and honest and sincere. And um, I'm, I love memoir. Um, at, at just I've loved it since I was uh, I was a kid. And yet it's such a rare thing to see in comics. Um, and, and so it, it just seemed like in a scenario where money wasn't an object, where I didn't have to worry about sales or anything like that, um, what story would I want to tell? And that ended up being the story. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 84, where we celebrate the year the original Apple Macintosh first went on sale. Apple, I am taking sponsorships. Feel free to send me a new M1 at any time. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Joshua Kemble about his book, Two Stories. Joshua Kemble is a full-time art director, freelance illustrator, and Zarek Award-winning cartoonist. His illustration clients have ranged from Scholastic to Random House. Joshua was born in 1980 in Tarzana, California, and grew up in the Antelope Valley. He received his BFA and MFA in illustration from California State University of Long Beach, and resides in Lancaster, California, with his wife and fellow artist, Maya Kemble, and son Benjamin. He's taught college art courses in design and illustration, and co-hosts both the Artcasters and the 48-Hour Art Check. You can see Josh's work at www.joshuakemble.com. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. This is your host, John Benaster, and I am super excited to come to you today uh, with author Josh Kemble, author of Two Stories, an exciting graphic novel about his life. Josh, say hello. Hi. Glad to be on. It's exciting. Yeah. Glad to have you. This is going to be a really interesting conversation uh, because, you know, it's both extremely rare. I talked to an illustrator, a graphic novel creator and combine all that with someone that took those talents and wrote a memoir. That's just, this is like uh, the ultimate Venn diagram here. Nice. So real excited for the conversation today. Cool. I am too. I, I'm a big fan of the uh, the show, so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, well, let's just start off with kind of the, the elevator pitch. What is, what's Two Stories all about, if, if you had to tell someone that had no idea? Okay, so I'm still rusty at elevator pitches, but I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, Two Stories is a memoir about faith and mental illness, um, and uh, it um, talks about a time in my life where my wife and I had moved to um, Oregon. At the time, she was just my fiance, and uh, had gone through sort of a double hit of mental illness uh, issues, <laughs> and mm. uh, which which led to um, me ultimately. Uh, being on a bridge ready to jump. And, um, and so the, the, the book kind of gets into um, some sort of childhood traumas that are like almost like playground politics type uh, drama. Um, so to a child, what causes sort of uh, childhood depression <laughs> and then kind of yeah. juxtaposes that with, um, with what that looks like in adulthood with more kind of severe uh, mental illness issues and tries to kind of tackle it head on in a very like truthful, honest way. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the elevator pitch, uh, um, which, which I know is heavy, but 
I also feel like with this book, it's important to be kind of um, upfront about like the the sort of the more serious nature of it. So yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you you need to know what you're getting into. Yeah, but what you're getting into, if you're ready for it, can be something amazing. I think oh, so. Cool. Yeah, I I agree there. And so, I mean, I think probably the the top question is, you know, this is an enormously um, uh, open and transparent and just, you know, bear all check on your life, you know? And so this just, you know, you're telling your life story to untold people that are going to be reading, uh, you know, unfamiliar people that are going to be reading it. And so this is a very, uh, you know, scary thing, I would think. So, you know, what, what made you decide that, you know, it's like, Hey, I have this, tragedy or you know this this these moments in my lives these things that befell me and you know i what made you want to tell that story and, and especially tell it in this graphic novel format yeah um so i mean uh first off like why i picked a graphic novel um i i kind of grew up uh in a in a strange and unique household where uh where my my mother was um an english teacher and an english major and then mm -hmm. my father was, uh, among many things, like he had like six degrees, <laughs> but, um, wow. but one of them was, um, was graphic design and he was a professional graphic designer for a long time, uh, back in the days of like paste up and where, where mm -hmm. everything was hand done. And, and so to me, when I like first read like an issue of like Spider-Man, like unlike a lot of kids, I had actually been reading books and then i i was introduced to it at, as like a free giveaway at a library um i remember the comic too it was called spider-man adventures in reading and it was one of those cool. comics to get kids from comics into reading books and right. it kind of did the reverse for me where it got me from books to comics where i was like wait a minute you can do this like this is perfect this is this is like art and literature married and and there's something mm -hmm. very intimate about that that i that i um i think kind of grabs hold of uh of of certain people so that's why i picked uh, graphic novels because i've just been in love with them for for so long and i think it's a great medium um particularly for memoir um and then why i chose to do this is 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 kind of interesting but um i uh I'd, I'd worked professionally as like a freelance illustrator and graphic designer for about 15 years and mm -hmm. went to grad school um, to kind of finish uh, and get my MFA, um, partially because I, I sort of wanted to teach. Um, initially, I went straight from like my, my first degree into an MFA program and then kind of dropped out because it was like, I don't want to teach. And then what's weird is I kind of changed my mind later on. Mm. Um, and was like, I actually would like teaching. So I've adjuncted a bit and stuff. But um, but uh, when, I, when I was working on uh, my MFA, and I've noticed this is a common thread with a lot of writers where um, you kind of go back to school, you're kind of in this scenario where money isn't an issue. Like, I mean, it is an issue. It's expensive to go to grad school. Right. But it's the, it, it, it kind of conditions um, a, a scenario that's kind of the perfect scenario for a creative, which is like, if money wasn't an object, like what art would you create? And mm -hmm. I had illustrated, you know, s some really silly books. I had gotten really known for, um, for like humorous, like B-movie poster type illustrations and particularly t-shirt design. And, um, and so that's a lot of what I was doing for, for a living. And, uh, and I kept feeling this desire to like tell um, a story that was like truthful and honest and sincere. And um, I'm, I love memoir, um, at, at just I've loved it since I was, uh, I was a kid. And yet it's such a rare thing to see in comics. Um, yeah. and, and so it, it just seemed like in a scenario where money wasn't an object where I didn't have to worry about sales or anything like that. Um, what story would I want to tell? And that ended up being this story. And part of why I picked this story and memoir too, is like, um, you know, for, for people who suffer from like depression or anxiety or different kind of mental, uh, issues, 
um, like we live in a society where, you know, like luckily the dialogue's changing a bit on it, but in general, it's sort of like not something people openly talk about. Um, and understandably so, right? Cause it's like, it's not the most uh, comfortable conversation at a party, but I've always been that strange person at a party who like, I really like those deep conversations about like what uh, what somebody's purpose is, what the, what their what how they find meaning, um, what mm. do they struggle with? Like I like the real stuff, and so it's it, uh, it I, I think it's important to have those dialogues because I think when you're in the thick of um, mental illness, uh, as I was at that time, um, and it's and it's like it's definitely one of those things where it's like not like something that just magically gets cured, like. Uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, have these things a, as like a, a dark cloud that's kind of following us throughout through our whole life. And mm -hmm. so I, I think that it's really important to have a very truthful and honest conversation about um, what depression is, what anxiety is um, for people who are actually going through it. And I think it's more common than people um, would admit or, or talk about. And so I think having open dialogue really head on discussions about it helps people. Um, I know it helped me at that time. Like whenever I would hear somebody candidly talk about like their own struggles with depression, I would feel less alone. And I think one of the main things, one of the, one of the bigger factors in, in, in uh, struggling with mental illness is, uh, is, you know, the, the feeling of isolation, like that you're unique and that this is an experience all to your own that you can't talk to other people about. Um, yeah. and so I, I just felt like, um, the subject matter was important too, just for people, um, who, who might be struggling with things like that. And then I also just, as a, a nerdy artist, uh, I think there's value in truth. So I thought it's, it's a good practice to try to write memoir as truthfully as possible. Um, and it's a good check to your ego. I think if you're doing it right, because you, you're going to find things about yourself that. Uh, that you don't like, that you have to exaggerate as opposed to, um, you know, my first attempts at memoir, I think I fell prey to the, the um, you know, the early writer's problem of like glorifying myself and making myself like the hero of, of the story. Yeah. And, uh, and so, so in this, I thought it was also another really important thing to try to kind of grapple with truth how do we represent truth? Like what is truth? And, and it's just a great topic for creativity. So, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, one thing that I wanted to hone in on a little bit, you mentioned this, the idea that people who deal with mental illness kind of can have that, that dark cloud hanging over them. Um, which to me is a really interesting point. You know, it makes, makes a lot of sense, but on the other hand, then it seems like to some degree, your you're almost like, I don't want to say feeding the cloud or, or exacerbating the cloud, but like, you know, you talk about how it seems like it took this 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 process, you took you years and years of your life to, yeah. to get to, you know, this this two stories, you know, and we're in book one here and it took you some, you know, five, six years to do. So you're sort of forcing yourself to relive a lot of this, right? And and maybe if the cloud had died down again it's like oh now it has to like you have to find it and you have to connect yeah. with it again and remember through it so it's like i, I don't know i i guess I, I i guess i admire your your fortitude to be willing to step up and engage with that that cloud again over that time period yeah i mean it's it's a mix right because um it, it definitely wasn't like therapy i think i think a lot of people will kind of think of memoir as therapy and i think for some people it is when they're writing it for me for me it it hasn't been in that sense like there have been parts where it's been very difficult to write there is a little bit of catharsis to kind of confronting some uh past events that were traumatic and kind of confronting that trauma um and like that the book two i'm like in the middle of and that's been really difficult to write like it's weird book one um is sort of writing about a, a, a few kind of anomalies um in my life you know um but yeah. book two is is going to be dealing with like ptsd and like being a victim mm -hmm. of violent crime and and wow. some stuff that like um is pretty uncomfortable to write about and kind of to relive and try to kind of do 
uh, do honor to like in the sense of like try to be true to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a mix, you know, but it is interesting. There were quite a, a few points um, when writing this where it got really uncomfortable to write. And my tendency was to like try to avoid it. And and one thing I kind of set um, early on when writing this, like for myself, was like to like lean into discomfort. Um, mm -hmm. And that's partially just from my experience. Like like one of my favorite right you know writers and comics that does memoir is Harvey Picar, and it's like he he talks about his anger issues and just like in such a blunt and honest and cutthroat way that like i don't think anyone reading it is like i really want to hang out with harvey p car you know like right. i think you get a, a picture of a person that's really i think enjoyable to read but um but uh but you i think in order to do this hopefully effectively like you kind of have to lean into the discomfort um so it is a weird thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a totally. weird thing. It's like on one hand, it's rewarding because it's using the language that I know to communicate, um, mm -hmm. and and art is my way of communicating visual communication. So if I didn't talk about these experiences with art, it, it would kind of feel like being muted in a weird way. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, but yeah, totally. It's, it's how you work through things and. Um, you know, one of the the other kind of major questions I had then is, is thinking about how you work through these events in terms of, you know, to, you, the, the book is two stories. There's clearly a big divide between your childhood, the, the childhood stories you tell, and then, the, you know, what happened in your adult life. Yeah. And, and you not only tell the stories differently, but you show them differently. The art is, the art style is completely different. I, I mean, to me, I, to my somewhat maybe untrained eye, about as different as artistic styles can get. Um, and so I, I guess I wanted to kind of check in there and, and you know, get a sense of, you know, what made you maybe talk about each of them and what made you decide to go one way or the other and, and how you kind of came up with those two representations of those phases of your life visually. Yeah. Um... That, that was important to me um, for a couple of reasons. I, I, one is that um, I, I, having worked professionally as an artist for a while, it's like you meet other artists. And, and I know so many illustrators and cartoonists who have multiple styles, mm -hmm. and they don't kind of utilize that toolkit when they're writing. And it's, it, it's so in, in one sense, it's something I've wanted to see. And a lot of that, that is actually what, what this comic is. It's like something that I felt should be done that I haven't seen done often. And so to me, that was one big motivating factor was like, we have this full vocabulary as artists. Um, and if we're, and if we're approaching this, like literature, you know, like writers often will switch like formats of writing. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. they'll, they'll switch tenses, you know, just to like, just to reinforce like the feeling, the emotion of a, of a, of a point in a story. And as an artist, it's like, I, I feel like, um, because I, because I can work in multiple styles, like why not, um, exploit that, uh, to, to try to kind of make the story have more of an emotional impact. Um, from a storytelling standpoint too, um, I'm trying to kind of draw a contrast in this book between like I, like I said, a kind of earlier, like the, between like childhood trauma mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, by that, but by that, I don't mean very serious childhood trauma, just childhood trauma, like, you know, feeling, uh, a desire to kind of control situations as a kid and not being able to deal with, uh, with the ability, the inability to control those situations is a much different um, weight to it than as an adult, like dealing with very similar things, mm -hmm. um, that can be a, a grander in impact on, on all levels. And so, uh, I thought it was important to have the, the stories, the art styles kind of change from a more realistic style, um, where it's, it's a much more traditional, I, I guess, comic book look where it's got kind of a Will Eisner or, um, you know, Klaus, Tomine, R. Crumb kind of style um, it with uh, where, where where it's dealing with weightier subject matter. 
um, mm -hmm. in the in the present, at least in the case of that story. Whereas like when we're going back to the past, I thought it was good to do a style that was more idealized and sort of cartoony and and uh, more like a Mary Blair, Jeff Smith, um, Walt Kelly kind of kind of look to it. Uh -huh. um, where, uh, partially because the stories themselves are a little less heavy. Um, and it also, uh, there's, there's another reason, which is just to give a little levity to the reader. Um, because it, it, you know, this book starts pretty heavy. And so it's, I, I think it, like on, on a subject matter, uh, it's, it's just some hard to process subject matter, I think for a reader too. And so yeah. I thought it was important to give readers like a break as well. Um, so the style also gives them like a, a visual break from mm -hmm. sort of the weighty real ness of the, of the present stories. Um, and then and also it's just like, you know, it, it's fun to exercise different, um, different styles. And, and I, I, it's definitely something I want, like I said at the top, like it's just something I, I want to um, see done more often. And I feel yeah. like a lot of great things in art, at least in my own career, have been done by like, you know, when I was doing t-shirt art, like that was one of the core things to like coming up with a really, a really uh, heavily well-selling um, t-shirt was like the idea of like, you'd come up with a concept and you knew you were kind of, you came up with a good concept. If you were like, this must have been done. And then you looked and nobody did it. And you're like, oh, well, that's that's like that's the thing that's going to do it. Um, and I feel like that with this, too, where it's like the the style shifting really should be should be explored more. But it's but it's also fun. And it's it's it, it's like trying to use all the vocabulary um, that I have to kind of to convey it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. And it seems like it's a really valuable, right? It's, it's a win for you. You get to express yourself more thoroughly. You use all the different skills, tools that you've developed as an artist. And like you said, it, it makes the reader, more, you know, should make, hopefully make the reader more interested. And it, it should also make it a little easier on them at the same time. So this is, this is sort of victory all around, <laughs> sounds like was the goal. And, and yeah. I, I think that makes, at least from my perspective, it certainly had that effect. Um, and even, beyond just the the changing of the style you also did a lot of things with changing of the layout even you know so this this isn't just like you know a four pane you know square you know layout to a page or whatever like each page is like a customized thing where you know some of them like when you're showing yourself being super excited at you know dressing up as indiana jones that might just take up most of the page is your indie costume you know and then maybe a couple things there so I, I thought that was also very dynamic to me in the way that I never really knew how things would look on each page. And it always gave me interesting new visual things to hunt and search around for on each page as I kind of was was given new things to awesome. look at. Um, and especially that's why I feel like for this kind of thing, like it's not the same in like ebook format or, 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 or it wouldn't quite be the same, you know, because having that physical object to like, you know, really you know, poke around in and, and hold a, you know, microscope to or whatever magnifying glass um, would make it makes it a lot more interesting. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely feel like comics in, in particular, and, and this this also goes to kind of why I, I picked graphic novel as the medium for a memoir. Um, there's something about graphic novels. Um, and I, th I think it's because like in a book, you have to, you know, it's a very intimate thing with a book because you have words and you have your imagination. And, mm -hmm. and, and to an extent, you have control of the pace as the reader, you know, um, yeah. but and, and complete control of the visuals other than like, you know, suggestions that are, are given, but, you know, with words or whatever. But with with graphic novels, something about the engagement it requires um, with your visual and textual mind like it yeah yeah it, it really creates like a very intimate uh reading experience and so to an extent reading a comic i think this is why like you know with like fiction comics um like superhero comics like people get really like people who get into comics and are really connected to comic book characters it becomes like a lifetime 
uh, connection with those mm-hmm. characters. Um, and people feel like they they have like a sense of ownership over them almost. Like, I think it's why people get like, really like, hey, that's not what these characters would do. Um, right, that's I not think canon, yeah. Because there's a feeling that you've like read a journal or a diary. Mm. Um, there's just a very like intimate nature to it. And I definitely would say, um, I, I would, I mean, I, I'm not against eBooks or e-comics, but <laughs> there is something uh, unique and important to, I think, um, reading a, a, especially a comic or a children's book i'd also throw that in there as well yeah i think there's yeah. something really important about having a, a physical book um and i've seen it with my kid too with my son if we read him like a digital book he just doesn't mm-hmm. have the same kind of intimate connection to it as he does with like a book where he can get in there and like turn the pages and look at the yeah illustrations. yeah for sure um and we, and we could probably just really delve deep into that rant about kids and their digital yeah. screens and everything, but um, but I do want to talk about the book and yes. and your life as uh, as as described in the book, and and like we've now dropped several times here, the book starts off really in a tough with you in a the toughest of tough places. Real, I mean, you are literally, you know, despondent. Uh, you know, th- searching for how to kill yourself and kind of wandering towards a bridge and having these thoughts. And, you know, it, it's really the kind of like kind of punch you in the gut just m- m- moment to start off with. So, you know, that that point is just like it, it really grabs you. Uh, and, I, and I guess I, and maybe that's the answer, but I was curious to hear from you, like, why that was what you wanted to show first like was there any particular reason why that was like i've got to get i've got to you know get people to to see this part right away so there's a couple reasons uh one is like i don't want to sucker punch readers (laughs) so so um i wanted to kind of set the stakes really early in the story Mm -hmm. um so that people knew what they were picking up and getting into um it I think it's, uh, I I also tend to like stories that are, that kind of jump in a linear fashion. Like they aren't necessarily told like point A, point B, point C. Um, I've always loved that. It might be just like the, you know, the era that I grew up in, like, you know, (laughs) everybody was obsessed with Tarantino and stuff. So it's like, I do love the idea of like starting with a middle point in a story or starting at a at a point that's not necessarily the beginning, um, but also I, I thought it would create hopefully like questions of, of people like curious like how how it got there. Um, right. But I also I mean the main reason was just to try to set up the stakes of the story, um, which you know in a memoir is is interesting, right? Because it's like you know, <laughs> I mean clearly you read it, it's a memoir, you know I'm not you know, um, going to make that, that fateful decision. But at the same time, I I think it establishes hopefully the stakes of the story. So you can, you can kind of see the overall arc. um, Right. This is serious. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, that you talk about um, while you're there, when you, when you're literally on the bridge is, is about, you know, you've gotten to this point, you're doing the searches to how to kill yourself, you go to the bridge. So in your mind, you clearly are like, this is the moment, this is time. Let's go for it. But you talk about how your body wasn't really ready. And you kind of were doing this sort of back and forth, like, okay, let's go. No, I'm not. And, and there was this disconnect between, you know, what your maybe higher level conscious mind was actively trying to tell yourself and your body to do versus what your you know, your lower level body sort of instincts, survival instincts were sort of just keeping you away from. And that was really interesting to me to to see that dilemma played out on the page. And so I guess, you know, I I, I was curious to know why you think that was happening to such a great degree and, and, and how, how that, you know, probably continues to happen to some, to some level. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's great. Um, actually, that's a really good question. <laughs> these are all great questions. But um, uh, so so 
to me, like one of the things that was interesting about that part of my life is, um, first off, like I wanted to get into like the rationalization that somebody goes through, because I think often people will look at um, someone who was suicidal or had a suicide attempt um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of judge them as like completely insane, like they've just lost their minds completely. Um, or, or, you know, talk about it being like a kind of break from a rational process. And one of the scary things about it is, is uh, a lot of people, I mean, when you're in the thick of like mental illness, you have your own kind of rationalization, which I tried to kind of go through in, in the book where a lot of it's very like, um, like list based thinking, um, where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, this happened and that caused this to happen. Therefore, like, so you're kind of building this list of all the wrongs or list ha list making when it comes to sort of future, right? Where it's like, um, you know, uh, it, even if this good thing happens, then in inevitably it's meaningless anyway, right? <laughs> like that, that sort of thinking. Um, but some of that thinking isn't like completely insane. It's, it's some of it's, it's fairly rational. And so, mm -hmm. I think what was happening at that time, um, and this is kind of one of the broader arcs of the story that the second volume will also be addressing, but it's like, I think what was happening at the time was a disconnect from what I rationally believed was true and what, um, like I spiritually knew was not true. Um, mm. and, and it's, so it's kind of like this break between sort of the instinctual and then the and then the rational and i think that's what was happening was like a, a sort of self-protection that mm -hmm. that we have instilled in us as as people um and and versus like a, a very rational process that that um at, at the time at least seemed like the most rational dis decision um and so a lot of that actually stemmed philosophically I know it's weird because it's a it's a small question, but it's such a um, it, it's got it, it kind of requires a way to your answer. Sure. Um, but it's like uh, I, I think that with me, at least at that point in my life, I was a very um, avid existentialist mm -hmm. and um, and existentialism had kind of led me to where it led a lot of its founders. <laughs> Um, where I had just kind of realized, like, you know, this idea of existentialism, one of the broad ideas on the more optimistic existentialist versions um, is, is the idea that, like, there's no meaning in life and that we kind of create our own meaning. And that's, right. that's what gives it meaning. And, uh, and, and there's, there's kind of two thoughts in, in, in the existentialist world um, or, or worldview, I guess, that that sort of you could go down, which is like one, like, okay, we create our own meaning, great. And the mm -hmm. other is to go, well, if we're just creating our own meaning, like, isn't that just kind of playing a stupid game? Like, we know there's no meaning. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, that's kind of where it had led me. Was, mm. um, I, and, you know, obviously it was fed by trauma and other things, but um, but that was sort of my worldview at the time. And I think that the, like my physical body did not agree with um, my belief system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah, know if fair. that makes sense. So I, I think it does. You know, uh, I think from what I know, my my limited knowledge of the brain, there's definitely you know higher order consciousness, and then you know different parts of the brain that that we share with very ancient ancestors that are just doing the things like breathing for us without us even thinking about them. And yeah, that's their job. And they're going to try and make us do that, you know, keep us going for as long as possible. So yeah, that is interesting to think about. Um, and then, okay. So we have this kind of, this, this kind of story where we start off there and this is sort of um, adult you. And then we switch styles. We go back in time. We go, to the playground, we go to, you know, you growing up. So kind of help, help take us back there, take us to the snowy mountain factory and your, and your life as a child, where you're, where you're at when we, you know, kick off that part of the book. Okay. So, um, uh, so, so the story goes through a couple, a couple stories, um, from childhood, a lot of them deal with like playground politics. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, 
and sort of the the general purpose at least as a writer like for putting those in there is like to kind of give an idea of like sort of like i think that um like i've struggled with depression like since like, being at a, a very young child mm -hmm. and uh and part of the depression usually stems from attempts to control things, which is probably why I do graphic novels, right? <laughs> um, because like, you have full control over everything. Yeah. Um, but uh, but being being like a person who wanted to attempt to control like even social scenarios um, as a kid, and then the frustration at the lack of being able to control my own reality. And I think that, um, that kind of started at a young age. So that's one of the reasons for like the, the selections of what I picked from, from childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but when I was a kid, we used to, um, my, my friend, uh, Jimmy and I, like, I, I had this, uh, good friend named Jimmy and we became friends cause we were both like pretty highly imaginative kids. And, um, so we, we sort of used to have this playground game where we would create snowy mountains and, and we we created our own company called snowy mountain factory <laughs> and what we would do is kind of dig in the sand and there was like a specific method to digging in the playground sand where we would like dig like three levels down under the tarp to like the clay <laughs> yeah. and kind of use that as the base of the snowy mountain and then we would use like the um the kind of softer mud over that and then, and finally, you know, use the, the top of the, um, of the sand in the playground box to kind of frost our mountains with snow. And, and we, we sort of did this like every recess for a while and it sort of created like a trend, like, <laughs> you know, a playground yeah. trend, um, which was new to me because I did, I didn't have an easy time as a kid making friends. I was like a nerdy book reading um non-athletic kid and so um it was it was this new experience where it was like suddenly all the kids on the playground were like dude we're doing snowy mountain factory this is awesome and for like a <laughs> yeah. very brief second i was like the foreman of this company um you know telling kids like no 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 that's not like the right method like you got to actually dig to that third level <laughs> and, yeah 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 and uh and so I felt like, oh, okay, great. I'm finally have cracked the code. Like I've finally figured out this, this, you know, way to have this popular game. And then of course the, you know, one of the popular kids in my class sort of took over the snowy mountain uh, factory. And I was sort of ousted as foreman and, uh, and my friend Jimmy as well, cause we were kind of outcasts. And so we were kind of kicked out of our own game that we had developed and uh, and we went on to try to make a new game. <laughs> and so that was a lot of our experiences uh, um, on playgrounds, like coming up with something really creative um, that was then kind of, it's, it's almost like a, the adult version would be like, you come up with a creative thing, it's killed by corporate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right. But or it's like copied child... by corporate and then taken from you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's like the childhood version of that. So yeah, so that was Snowy Mountain Factory. Um, and then from there, I get into sort of some, some wilder um, things where we tried to recreate Back to the Future. As one does. I mean, it just... That seemed, I mean, that was a, clearly the next logical evolution. You go from mountains to movie making. Totally. And I think I part it. of why I was obsessed with Back to the Future as a kid is, um, you know, and this, the book addresses this too, but I was going to like a Christian school. And so mm -hmm. part of Christian school and that sort of society of, um, it, it's like a, I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain to, to people who, who weren't, didn't grow up in it, but in, in that kind of culture, you know, there's like this idea of like secular and then Christian books and secular and Christian music mm -hmm. and secular and Christian movies and stuff. Yeah. And um, as a kid, like my, my parents were pretty open-minded when it came to like books, they let me read and stuff like that. But with films, like we weren't allowed to watch a lot of movies. We didn't have like mm. a, a lot of cable or a, 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 any sort of connection other than like the, the basic channels you could get with like the bunny ears. Yeah, and, um, same on, on your TV, and so like Back to the Future was one of the movies I was allowed to watch, and 
I was just like, this is the best. So right. um, we decided to kind of recreate it. Like we, we were like, okay, the snowy mountain factory thing didn't work. So we're going to recreate this movie. And, uh, and we cast all like we, we, once again, very much like snowy mountain, it, it got really popular. We cast all our playground buddies and, uh, and, um, I was of course Marty cause I came up with it. <laughs> And then even that like got accosted and kind of taken over by the same group of popular kids. Um, and it was partially because I couldn't at the time say a bad word um, because I was like a good kind of Christian school kid. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask about that. I mean, that that just must have been so crushing to you because this time it was sort of like your own like respons re responsibleness yeah. caused this to happen, like hoisted by your own petard. Like it how how did that feel for you you know knowing that you you know you care about pleasing your parents and being a good kid and all yeah. that but it's like clearly in this case you know this has led you astray yeah like wait a minute i'm if i do all these good like i feel like you're taught in school if you act properly and do the right yeah. things the rewards come to you yeah but this must have been a clear case of wait i'm doing what i'm supposed to do but i'm not getting the accolades yeah. So how, how did you process that? Totally. So, um, well, I mean, so that that's the thing is like, I think that as a kid, I, you know, and, and, you know, I, there's a, a juxtaposition too to that and like kind of the experience as an adult, but it's like, as a kid, like you kind of have this idea, especially in that kind of bubble of, mm -hmm. of that world um, that, yeah, like you said, you follow all the right rules, you kind of do these things, you'll be rewarded. Um, and I, I, for me, I think, um, I, I think I didn't deal with it. Well, I think, I think my, my main reaction to that was like kind of that people are stupid. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. I would kind of internalize and just draw my own stuff. Um, and, and what's weird is I actually think that's a pretty common, um, narrative for, uh, artists. Like I've, I've noticed hmm. a lot of artists and writers, um, have like pretty highly uh, active imaginations and kind of internal internal worlds and uh, and also like you know once again like the desire to control and and um, you know in a scenario where it's like a group project you can't quite control everything um, and I, I can definitely guarantee that as like I, my day job's an art director it's like you cannot control right. <laughs> um, all elements of something um, and, and really like to, to do a team activity requires a lot of collaboration and a lot of kind of, um, uh, compromise. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but as a kid, I was just a, a really strange kid in the sense where a lot of kids my age at that time would have been like compromise. And I, I didn't, um, mm -hmm. I just kind of went the other route. Um, but I do remember um, socially things getting a little better. And this is in the book as well. Um, when I finally sort of met a good friend who sort of stood up to bullies, uh, yeah. to, it's still a friend of mine today, um, named Jacob. Oh, wow. and, and, uh, and he, um, he, uh, taught me how to cuss and how to like not be a nerd. <laughs> and that was helpful too. He likes um, skills. Although I'm still yeah. a nerd at heart, but it, it's like, you know, he kind of introduced me to rock and roll and a lot of um, a lot of great things that have kind of actually to this day helped me in life. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really important. I, it's so interesting to me how like th those things that make you a nerd that make you stand out oftentimes also then help you, you know, in, in a circular way later on. Yeah. There's just that gap that you have to bridge a little bit sometimes where maybe you need help and you have to connect with the bigger world. Oh yeah. And then hopefully you can try and get to that place where right. your inner nerd can come out and be what it wants and help you succeed because that you have all these creative ideas and skills and things that a lot of other people don't. For sure. And and I, and I also think like I hadn't quite dealt with the hypocrisy of of that sort of um school system. And so it's like yeah. I I sort of get into that as well. But a lot of it was sort of like this Christian culture bubble that, that um, you know, it's, it's weird because I'm, I'm actually a Christian now, but I am mm -hmm. not the same 
kind of Christian. Like I'm actually pretty opposed to um, like that, that sort of evangelical bubble. <laughs> I yeah. just, I, I don't, um, I don't think it's healthy and I don't think it's necessarily like even true to like the faith it claims. And so, um, but, but as a kid, it's like, you know, you're kind of indoctrinated in those systems and right. the book, book gets into that a little bit too. Um, and, and it's usually connected to other things, like a lot of, you know, a, a lot of works-based ideas and, um, as well as like, you, you know, um, like political based ideas that are somehow woven into the belief system and you're kind of indoctrinated in that. So I think as a yeah. kid too, I didn't really know how to navigate that. Um, and actually that, that sort of followed me a lot of my life until probably like my, mm. my mid twenties. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's quite fair to ask a child to navigate that to be totally fair to you. I agree. You know, I mean, <laughs> well, a little, little bit difficult, but Okay, so let's let's jump ahead again here. Love so, it. So um, we, you know, we get back to to one of the kind of core things, which is we then connect with um, what happened with you and my and uh, the panic attack. So maybe maybe tell us about her a little bit and and kind of what what happened with the panic attacks and yeah. Um, and I really uh, this one line you wrote that I that I really thought you know i really felt was the worst part of the attacks was what they revealed about me so i'm really especially curious you know from your perspective you know how those panic attacks happened but also what they revealed about you yeah so um and and this part i include in the book for for a couple of reasons one is i really wanted to tackle mental illness in general yeah and, and i think one of the things that's not addressed a lot is caregiving um, people mm -hmm. don't really talk honestly about that. And I, and I think that's an important topic because especially at the age I'm at, it's like a lot of my friends and myself very soon are going to be probably caregiving for our parents, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and, um, and, and, and usually like, you know, in fiction, even it's sort of painted with a, a, a much brighter brush than, um, than I think that scenario can be. So, so anyhow, so my wife, um, has a panic disorder and I knew this kind of when we first met, um, she had kind of mentioned it, but, but at the time being like a really avid existentialist, I was like, you know, like we have con more, con I, I really believed in the power of the mind and the power of the mind to kind of overcome. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I was kind of your staple person that a lot of people who deal with mental, uh, mental illness and mental health struggles like hate because <laughs> i was the yeah. guy who'd be like oh just snap out of it like i have i've yeah. had depression and i've just gotten it over it you know right um, work harder which i don't yeah. believe now but yeah. um but at the time i you know i think it's an easy belief to have until things get to a point where you literally your mind is just not within your control mm -hmm. um so so anyhow my wife and i kind of knew these things about each other that I had depression, she had panic disorder, and we had kind of worked past that point in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we have gone through some pretty traumatic things, which will be addressed in, in the second volume of this book, because um, it's kind of being told backwards. <laughs> um, but, uh, but um, you know, long story short, like there had been some, like I was a victim of violent crime in Long Beach, and uh, mm -hmm. these are some spoilers for the second book. Um, and then shortly after was like accosted by a neighbor and kind of held hostage. It was like a weird, Whoa. crazy scenario. Um, yeah. and sort of one of the impetus, uh, reasons we moved to, to Portland. So following that, like we, we both were kind of at tense points that, that people aren't really pushed to very often. Um, mm -hmm. and then just to add to that, like moving, uh, we, we had at that point had to move like four times <laughs> in like a year oh, or three yeah. times in a year and moving is extremely stressful on mental health and, uh, moving to a different state where you don't know anyone is, is kind of a, a thing. And then the weather of Oregon is right. you don't get sunlight, stuff like that. So yeah. my wife, um, my wife, once we got a, up to Portland, Oregon, started getting hit with these in, incredibly debilitating panic attacks. Um, and at first they were sort of like just feeling like dizzy 
And then it kind of progressed to not being able to get out of bed, not being able to Mm -hmm. move, like just being completely frozen in panic. Well, not frozen, but like shaking in panic um, and feeling like, like she's going to die, like feeling like there's this, a sincere thing going on. And, at, at, and, uh, and I failed at, at kind of, um, caregiving for her. Um, mm-hmm. you know, cause at, at initially, um, my thought was just like, Hey, snap out of it. Like, you know, you have a life to lead. Like I have a life to lead. We have a rent, we have a rent to pay at the time. Um, and, uh, and yet, like, she just, she wasn't able to go to work. She wasn't able to do anything. Yeah. And so I was sort of navigating that. And um, instead of kind of getting better at caregiving, I sort of, like, did take care of her, but just doing the bare minimum. Um, but I also started just getting really angry and resentful. And and um, this lasted for, you know, for, you know, a month or two, you know. And it yeah. was like... Um, so like the first few weeks I, I was okay at like, Oh, here's food. Here's, but you know, months into it, I just kind of like lost my ability to be like a, a good, um, support to her. And so her family actually came and kind of bailed us out and helped us out. And I, I, it, even in that, like kind of failed where instead, you know, I think the rational response would be like, thank God, like I need help. Like this is, yeah. this is helpful. But I felt like as a man, like this pressure to kind of provide for, uh, you know, your significant other and, um, and like, you know, to be, be able to meet their emotional needs and stuff and the fact that i had mm-hmm. failed at that and wasn't able to kind of be that person to do it just drove me nuts um uh and so the book kind of gets into that um i did research panic disorder and um and uh when it was after my wife had had left like she she ended up at the time she was my fiance i keep calling her my wife because she's my wife now but um uh But yeah, so like her family took her back to California to kind of watch Mm -hmm. over her. And I I was sort of left in the apartment alone. And at that point was when I kind of like started reading more about anxiety and panic disorder and was just like, I am, I did like every single thing you're not supposed to do um, for somebody dealing with panic disorder. Yeah, I mean, uh, so what do you feel like are some things that you could have done or, or would have done? Well, I mean, one is just acknowledging that it's real is a huge thing, I think, for anyone with mental illness. Like part of it's the, the first thing with like a mental disorder is like knowing what the enemy is, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, so if somebody deals with depression, like there, there's actually a comfort for the for them or like somebody dealing with anxiety or anything else. I, I've met quite a few people who have different mental disorders and just being able to name it actually gives um, get, gives help and comfort to the people suffering from it um, because yeah. you, you actually are naming and acknowledging an enemy. So that would be step one. <laughs> um, the other would be to just kind of be more supportive during it. And um, and once again, it's a it's a fine balance. Um, none of these things are easy, right? Like like yeah. if you're dealing with somebody who's a depressive, like um, you know. You don't want to enable it, um, but you also don't want to disregard it, and and you definitely want to lend an ear. And so it's like there there's this fine balance um, equally with with anxiety, where it's like you kind of have to walk this tightrope mm-hmm. between uh, holding the person accountable um, for like carrying their responsibilities, but at the same time um, um, supporting them at, at times where it gets impossible to get out of bed. Um, very similar to, very similar to any, uh, mental disorder where it's like, you, you really just need to support and encourage them to seek help, um, encourage them to take medication, encourage them to, you know, see a counselor, like, um, you know, hear them out. Like, um, don't, you know, definitely don't say it's in their head. I remember, you know, and I addressed this in the, you know, I initially, I thought something was um, physically wrong with my wife. And so we went to the hospital and the doctor was like, there's nothing physically wrong, you know? 
Mm. And so I remember holding that over um, her, which is, I would recommend don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Where I was like, there's, yeah. they said there's nothing physical. It's not physical. That's yeah, terrible. Um, yeah, because wow. it's like, it's, it's like telling somebody with a broken leg, like to, to just like fix their leg. And you're like, well, you need like a cast. And I mean, this is a, or just to, telling somebody with a broken leg, it's all in their head. You know, it's uh, right. It's not, not a good thing to do. So I, I would say just like, listen more, um, care, be more responsible in the sense of like taking it seriously. Um, yeah. And not just assuming somebody has, you know, um, is choosing it. I think that sure. would be the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so we, we kind of covered the creative process and we covered your, the two different styles mm -hmm. and the two stories and the two, you know, moments in time. So as we kind of wrap it up a little bit, I just wanted to check in and see if there was anything else that you hoped people would kind of get out of this that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the main things is just like, I, I, I really do hope um, that people, when they're going through these kind of things, um, realize they're not alone in it. And mm -hmm. uh, particularly with, you know, suicide, I know it's cliche, <laughs> um to say but it's like you know at the time that i was on like burnside bridge um you know i i was unmarried um you know and um fairly in like the pit of despair where i didn't think um there would be like a greater purpose in my life or anything like that and mm -hmm. i have since like you know i have a seven-year-old son now i have um you know I, maya and i are married we we know better how to navigate our mental issues um mm -hmm. and while while things haven't become rosy and perfect um there is hope and uh and it it you know th that was one of the big drivers in writing this book was to um to try to kind of give people a picture of what that looks like when you're in it so that people who are in it like realize like there's a way out of it um that's not necessarily the the one minute decision that could that you can't fix yeah. um and so i i know that's you know it's cliche to say but i would definitely say um you know like seek help and and seek friends and uh seek the national suicide hotline <laughs> if you're if you're at that um point and also just like seek literature by people who've gone through it and not necessarily my book. I mean, there's, there's some great podcasts out there. Um, there's, there's great resources out there, um, like yeah. that, that can provide comfort. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. And, um, so I think you, know, you already talked a little bit about this. Is, is there anything in particular that you want to, let people know about uh, the second part. Oh yeah, because this it was interesting to me that that you. I assume it's just because you were like, okay, I need to get something out into the world. Like you probably were working on this for so long, you just like I have to have to see something hit the world. But so you mentioned earlier, the second part we'll talk a little bit about the kind of maybe PTSD side of it all. Do you see that as kind of like a natural continuation? Like you're going to be continuing the styles, the stylistic decisions yes. and all that stuff? Or, or what do you, how are you imagining the second part? And, and are you doing anything differently so far? So the second is going to diverge a bit um, in style. Um, and, and, and like you, you've noted, like the first book, um, what will continue is like there, I, I try to approach paneling pretty playfully. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so while I'll follow like a grid, um, I break the grid at quite often. I'll do weird things like, you know, use like a YouTube video search as, right. as, as that. a paneling yeah. structure. Um, so I'm going to be continuing that, like the exploration of like what we can do with panels and stories. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but, but, but it definitely will be, um, like the end of the fully structured arc will be in the, in the um, book. And one thing you'll notice in two stories too, is like, it's, it's usually it's title. It's really transparent in the story structure so that the chapter titles are literally the point, the plot point <laughs> on right. a, on I a remember. pretty standard 
um, story arc. And so um, the the second book will follow that plot point all the way to the climax and the um, you know conclusion and resolution. Um, all right. And so, um, yeah, but like, but I'm I'm right now. I'm about, I mean, the script is finished for it. It's been edited and, and ready. And I'm about like 60 pages into um, the rough pages. Um, mm -hmm. So I do like a rough version of the pages and the final version. Um, and so if you ever want like a sneak peek, like I actually, just to keep myself in the writing process, I post those on my Instagram. Um, oh, great. If anybody yeah, actually wants a little out. sneak sneak peek at the book before it's done so yeah yeah what's your what's your instagram let people know oh um i always forget so isn't that terrible <laughs> i think it's josh let's see uh, oh my goodness i think it's josh kemble joshua kemble on instagram joshua kemble so yeah got it cool well we uh, I know that this was a, this is a memoir, so we now know a lot about you. Yeah. But even still, as per tradition, we do a little thunder round to get to know people. Love so it. So I think I'm gonna subject you to it anyway. I think it'll be quick and fun. Sounds good. Uh, cool. All right. So, question number one: What is your favorite food and/or drink? Um, food, breakfast burrito, chorizo. It's nice. like the the best food. It's not just my favorite food. It is the best food. <laughs> it is objectively. Uh, in, in California, don't. Don't mess with like fake Mexican food in any other state. It's right. Like not, not real Mexican. Food. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then drink. Um, I, I am so torn on that. I tried to think of it, but anything by Bravery Brewing, it's a local brewery here, uh, cool. microbrewery, and they make uh, exquisite IPAs I couldn't pick. So nice. I like it, the local plug. All right, number two, where is your favorite place you've ever been? Um, favorite place I've ever been in. Um, I think that uh, as cliche as it is, it's kind of torn between two things. One is like in Portland, Oregon, Powell's books as a book nerd is mm -hmm. one of the coolest experiences of my life. Weirdly enough, it's it's literally like, and, and it, it's only rivaled by, in Long Beach, there used to be a store called Acres of Books, which unfortunately mm -hmm. I believe closed. Um, but they're these like mega bookstores, but they're not owned by like a, mega, a, a giant bookstore chain. And uh, they're, they're the type of bookshop where you can kind of peruse around and come, come up with like the weirdest discoveries of like these beautiful yeah. out of print books. Um, so that's that's on one hand, and then on the other, it's just very cliche. But I still have really fond memories of um, of the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's just wow. yeah. there's something stunning about that. Just to kind of yeah. see um, something that like you feel on a level that almost makes it feel like art is purposeless. <laughs> mm. But yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I've been there. It's uh, yeah, it's quite majestic. Mm -hmm. um, all right, last question. If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Ooh, this question, the, the answer to this would change a lot, but right now it's it's probably pretty common with a lot of writers. I would, I would uh, wish that comics took less time to create, that like mm. somehow I could find a time machine to create art and not need to sleep. So like that, that would be the, um, the thing I, I'd change right now, just selfishly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're totally allowed. It's your your wand, your wish. Yeah. So, on that note, uh, Josh, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks. The book is Two Stories, Part One by Josh Kemble. Um, in case you haven't figured out, it's just a fantastic memoir, and I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, thanks again, Josh, for sharing your life with all of us. No, oh, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. Mm -hmm.